This is Ken Johnson for another episode of SecCast. Today's episode will cover using Python slash Jython and Burp Extender to build Burp plugins. The first thing we want to do is install Jython. I'm using Homebrew, so that means I can use Brew install Jython. However, if you're using something like the apt package manager or yum, you will have to use those package managers to install Jython instead. The syntax should be fairly similar. The jython.jar file is installed under the user local seller jython lib exec folder. And we need to provide burp with the location of that jython.jar file. This allows us to write jython code and have burp translate that to its native Java form. This will allow us to interact with Burp's API. So to recap, we've installed Jython and we've provided Burp under the extender options tab and within the Python environment section with a location of the jython.jar file it needs. The first thing we're going to do is create an extension that is essentially a hello world. It prints to Burp's interface and is fairly straightforward and basic. The first thing we will do is import the iBurp extender class. This will be used anytime you create an extension and is required to hook into Burp. The next thing we want to do is import the Java IO print writer class so that we can print to Burp. And we have to create a Burp extender class which implements iBurp extender. In addition to always requiring the iBurp extender class, we also have to leverage the register extender callbacks function anytime we create a burp extension. This provides us the ability to call functions on the callbacks object, which we will discuss later in this tutorial. Additionally, we want to give our extension a name, so we will call the callbacks.setExtension name function and provide it a string value of setcast tutorial jython. Additionally, we want to print our output to burp. In order to do that, we have to create an object that we can print to. So we will create a standard out object, and that will be the receiver of print writer. We'll provide print writer our callbacks.get standard out. And this just basically redirects output to burp's interface. Additionally, we'll call standard out.printline and we'll say hello from setcast. And lastly, we'll enter return so that the superclasses register extender callbacks method is actually called. And that's it. And lastly, we want to add our code to burp. So we'll go to the extender extensions tab and click add. We'll choose Python from the drop down menu, select our file, hit next, and hello from setcast. So that extension works. We'll move on to the next extension, which is a little bit more interesting. The application you are looking at is named PyGoat. It is an OWASP project and it is a vulnerable version of Django. Now this application leverages client-side cookies, which means the cookies are signed but are reversible and viewable by the client. So we're going to go ahead and register for an account on PyGoat. And we have to enter some normal details here. And after we've done that, what we want to do is view our cookies to see what our cookie sort of looks like. When we do this, what you'll notice is that the cookie's value is a bit strange. It's a long value and uh, not something that's clearly or easily picked apart. So really our goal here is to see what this value actually represents. Note that in our HTTP history and while viewing a single request, only the raw params, headers, and hex tabs exist. We want to add a fifth tab to show the Django cookie once reversed we won't be able to tamper with the cookie, but hopefully we will be able to see some interesting data. What you're looking at is the documentation and code behind Burp's API. For right now, we just want you to be aware that this is how we've gleaned what is required to create this plugin. We know we want to leverage the iMessage Editor tab and iMessage Editor tab factory to create another tab and put some content inside of it. This documentation helps with that. We know what methods to override and which to invoke in order to obtain our desired outcome. So we'll open our text editor of choice and create a file named Django cookie deserialization.py. We need to import some libraries for our code to work. The first one would be iBurp extender. This will always be the case when writing a burp extension. The second is iMessage editor tab factory as well as iMessage editor tab. As is always the case, we'll create a class that implements iBurp extender. 
This gives us our initial hook into the burp API. Additionally, we will implement the iMessage editor tab factory. This gives us access to the method create new instance, which allows us to create a new instance of our tab when looking at the HTTP message editor in something like proxy history, for example. Notice that we've created a register extender callbacks method, as is always the case when creating a class that implements iBurp extender. Additionally, we've created a callbacks object. We've named it self.underscore callbacks. Self.underscore, in essence, allows us to call that object anywhere within the class versus only within the register extender callbacks method. Next, we would like to create a helpers object. This allows us to call some methods on that helpers object, things like normalizing an HTTP request. And then we want to give our plugin a name, so we'll call callbacks.set extension name. And then we're going to register the burp extender class as a message editor tab factory, so we'll give it the keyword self. Lastly, we'll want to return so that the register extender callbacks method defined in the iBurp extender class is invoked. We've registered the burp extender class as an instance of the iMessage editor tab factory. That means we need to create a method called create new instance, which returns an instance of a class that implements the iMessage editor tab class. We'll name this deserialize cookie. We will go ahead and create that deserialize cookie class. The deserialize cookie class takes four arguments. Those arguments are extender, controller, and editable. The class implements iMessage editor tab. Extender is an instance of the burp extender class. Controller is an instance of the iMessage editor controller class. And editable is a Boolean value, either true or false, and this indicates whether or not the tab is editable by a user. So we'll create an object called text input, and this represents extender.callbacks.create text editor. So it's really burp extender class, the underscore callbacks object, and then calling create text editor on that. And we'll create a cookie normalization object, which represents a class we have not yet created. The class will be called cookie normalization. Self dot underscore extender, that represents the burp extender class. And all of these are defined upon first initializing the deserialize cookie class. Now, because we have implemented the iMessage editor tab class via the deserialize cookie class, we must also define a method named getUI component as described in the burp API documentation. This method is invoked by our editor of choice in order to determine whether or not the tab should be enabled when viewing an HTTP message. On line 27, you'll notice we created an object named text input. It is the receiver of extender.callbacks.createTextEditor. If you look through the API documentation, it shows that createTextEditor is actually an instance of iTextEditor. iTextEditor has a method called getComponent, and this can be toggled between true or false to determine whether or not a tab is editable by the user. So in essence, all we are really saying here is that when getUIComponent is called, it will return an instance of iTextEditor.getComponent. We'll create a method named isEnabled. This will determine whether or not the tab shows up on an HTTP message. So the first thing we're going to say is, if this request is true, then do something. In this case, we want to create a request info object that is a result of calling extender helpers dot analyze request with the content that was provided to this method. We're going to extract the headers from request info dot get headers. We're going to instantiate a cookie object and that's going to be an empty string and then we're going to enumerate the headers array. So we're going to look for a header that matches the word cookie going to build a cookie string object, which is the result of calling cookie normalization dot extract cookie, a method we have yet to define, but we will. And then we'll create a self underscore cookie object, which is a result of self dot cookie normalization dot normalize cookie with the result of the previous line's code execution, which is cookie string. And lastly, we will return true if the message is both a request and we were successfully able to create the self dot underscore cookie object. The value of self dot underscore cookie is what will ultimately be displayed to the user of this plugin. Next, we will create a set message method. If the value of content, which is the message, is none or nil, we will show nothing in the tab. If the value of the content is not nil or null 
or none, we will show it in the tab. What we will show is the value of self dot underscore cookie. You could think of all the code we've written up until now as prep work for the actual engine that will drive this, which is the deserialization and decompression of the Django cookie. This is where the next code that we write comes into play. There are a handful of libraries that we must import in order to successfully decompress and deserialize the Django client-side cookie. We'll use RE for regular expression, Zlib for Zlib decompression, Base64 for Base64 decoding, and Pickle for Pickle deserialization. We'll create a class called Cookie Normalization and define a method named Extract Cookie. We're going to take the cookie that was given to us and search for session ID equals. We're going to take the match group number one from that data object and return the cookie data. So essentially we're going to take the value of session ID equals and return it. The next thing we're going to do is create a method named b64 underscore decode. It will be provided a string. This string is the session ID cookie. We're going to generate a number object that will be used to create a pad. We're going to try and return the base64 decoded version of the string and the pad. And if there is an exception, we'll print that exception. The next thing we will do is create a method named normalize cookie. And this is really where the cookie is decompressed, it's picked apart, it's deserialized, and you get the real value of what the cookie represents. This is the data that we want to see in the tab. After reviewing the Django core signing code, I determined that there are only four steps that really need to occur. One is to split the cookie into three parts using the colon as a separator, then base64 decode that value, then zlib decompress it, and lastly, pickle deserialize using pickle.loads. And the last thing here is that we just want to handle exceptions properly. Now the next step is to navigate over to extensions and add this file. So we'll choose Python and select our file and go ahead and load it up. Now I left this error in the video. It is important to know that the errors generated through your Jython plugin are often lacking verbosity and are not deterministic. So it's best that you write your code to handle exceptions when they occur and properly print them to the screen. So we'll go ahead and correct our mistake here and create a proper pad object. Really it's just the result of multiplying the number object by the equal character. Then we will load our Django code up into burp. There are no errors. Next thing we're going to do is go ahead and refresh this browser to send some traffic through burp. And we will review burp's proxy history and look at a single message. Note the deserialized cookie tab, and we have a deserialized and decompressed cookie. It shows that we are auth user ID 3. I'm Ken Johnson. Thank you for watching SecCast.